Hello, thank you for watching and listening to the Woodsong Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Larson, and today we've got an interview with Christy Dragonis, also known as the Bird Mentor. I don't know if I, I said her name right, by the way, <laughs> but uh, she doesn't care. She's pretty chill. Um, this is a great interview about... You know, what is bird language, um, the different things that Christy teaches about birds, and she's just an, an all-around uh, bird uh, nutcase. Um, or maybe if bird's a, a seed case. Uh, bad dad jokes there. Anyhow, uh, I do want to do a quick apology kind of before the, the video gets started. Unfortunately, a, a few things flawed this from being a, a totally ideal podcast. The first is uh, there was a, a mix up with my microphone uh, recorded from my laptop's microphone for some reason. So the audio quality on my end is not good. Christie's end is, is pretty good. Um, the other negative thing, though, is that, uh, you know, my dog was barking through like a, a short portion towards like three quarters of the way through. And uh, it's actually where she's explaining the curriculum she has set up for uh, for learning about birds. So bad, bad uh, job there, Sam. But other than that, it's a really great interview. Christy's a really incredible person uh, to listen to and to learn from. And I hope you guys enjoy it. You are still in Durango, right? Awesome. In Durango. How's it? Is it like super cold there? Lots of snow or? Um, you know, we've had a really mild winter, but the last two weeks it's been really cold. It's like today it didn't get above freezing, which, you know, it's great because we, it brought the snow back to us. Um, we, we're not getting too much, but some, you know, but the nights have been cold, like around six degrees or so. Wow. That's really cool. Yeah, but for you guys, that's probably nothing. Yeah. Really cold and really specific, actually, as well. Yeah. <laughs> six degrees, yeah. It's exactly six degrees. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, in Nebraska, Nebraska's got the weird sweat. It's like, it's a little bit wimpy. People are like, I am so glad, uh, I'm so ready for this cold weather to be done. And I'm just, it's not really that cold here. I mean, sometimes it gets bad, but yeah. it's really not. Um, it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. Um how, how did you end up in Durango? I think it's kind of an interesting story. Like, you got to... Did you, you live most of your, like, adult life in the Pacific Northwest, right? Yeah, so I grew up in Connecticut, and then um, when I was... Gosh, it was, like, two years after college, so I was 20-something or other, I got a job at a place called the Wolf Education and Research Center. So I worked with a pack of wolves for about a year, and then I got a job working for the Wilderness Awareness School um, after that. So then that was, that's what I did um, for about five years. Um, that's where I learned bird language, was at the Wilderness Awareness School when I was teaching there. Um, and then after that, I lived in Washington, I traveled a lot, I traveled around the world for a year, I did lots of stuff like that. And, um, and what brought me to Colorado was really the sun because I just missed it so much. And being in Washington, it was a little bit too dark for me for too long. So, yeah, so I was looking for a sunny place to move to, and I found a job in Colorado. So I moved here about seven years ago. Well, you're working for like a uh, one of those Wild wilderness therapy programs, right? Yeah, exactly. Yep, yep. I was working for a wilderness therapy program. Yeah, that's kind of that's what brought me out here. Yep. Wilderness therapy. There's almost everyone no nah, i shouldn't say that i half of the people who've done podcasts so far at some point worked in wilderness therapy really yep yep yeah it's it's a really it's a growing field for sure you know and it's an option for you know when i was when i got out of college there really unless you were a biology major like there weren't many options for people to go do something in the natural world and now there's just like there's so much available to people it's incredible yeah, I think it's good for people who want to become instructors in the outdoors. That they can yeah. learn, learn how to teach a lot. Uh, yeah. Even though they're not getting paid a whole ton, but you like learn how to teach a lot and teach like unwilling people. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> Do you yeah, any... you learn a lot by yourself too. You know, it's just like yeah. it's self growth. It's just you learn how to be a good communicator and. Um, yeah, I think it's it is a great experience. It's hard work. It's really hard work. And I mean, they're they're out there right now, you know, and it's six degrees and windy and cold, and uh, those kiddos and and the guides are out there at the moment. So, you know. Do you have any like funny stories from your time working in wilderness therapy? Funny stories. Yeah. Well, she thinks uh -huh. about folks who don't know. It's like 
you, you take uh, a kid who's having some problems or their parents think they're having problems, I mean, a million different reasons, from, like, we think he's obsessed with video games to he mm -hmm. brought a gun to school or something like that, you know, all these different different kids that come together and, and then the woods fixes them. So yeah, that's totally. Like, it's a that's, like, general therapy theory. Yeah, 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 and you're right. Like, I would say that uh, probably, like, 80% of the healing that happens for – the kids out there is because of the natural world you know it's nature that does the work for you and and then there's the therapists and the field guides and stuff and they're they're definitely they play a prominent part in in the healing for the kids but and the transformation that happens for the kids but um i think the natural world is essential i think that's why a lot of talk therapy just doesn't work because you're inside a, a room and yeah. you know you have to connect with the natural world to to really heal your heart and soul um we all do i mean that's that's where i go to i mean yeah, we might talk about that a little bit later, but um, when I was a kid, that's what I would do to, um, when I was sad or mad at my parents or I was having a really hard time with my family, whatever it might have been, I would run to the woods and I'd go sit by a tree, you know, and, and then I'd come back when I was feeling better. And so um, I think it's a natural thing for us to want to be close to nature when we're feeling sad or scared or, you know, just lost in general, you know. Yeah. Were, were you a troubled yeah. kid? I don't think I would. I probably <laughs> wouldn't have made it into a into a wilderness. I I guess it depends on who you talk to. Um, I I did my fair share of uh, getting into trouble when I was in high school. Um, but I don't know about troubled. Um, I wasn't. You know, I didn't have addictions, and um, that's why most of the kids come is sort of like depression, addiction, and stuff like that. And right, I right. wasn't struggling with that when I was a kiddo, but. Um, I definitely had some hard times in my, my family and, you know, so, I have a, yeah. I have a friend who, it wasn't, it wasn't with his group. Someone else had, they dropped a rock on their guide's head. This is not with your program. This is like a, a different one. And, yeah. uh, and then the guy had, uh, and then on a separate occasion, cause they take their knives and their shoes at night. He made yep. a, he made a pair of sandals and he made a flint knife and he just took off. And wow. it's like, yeah. you passed, man. <laughs> Good job. No, for real, for real. <laughs> Some of the kids tried. There was a kid in, in the program. I still have a bunch of friends who are in this program, and there's a kid that just tried to, to run, but because it was so cold, he only ran like 20 feet and realized, like, it's too cold. <laughs> I don't want to go anywhere. <laughs> so he didn't get very far. <laughs> yeah. They say, that, you yeah. know, the cold really keeps out the riffraff. And, you know, crime is yeah. lower, and kids don't yeah. run away as much when it's freezing cold. It makes a yeah. lot of sense. It does make a lot of sense, yeah. I, I actually, when I was a kid, I was upset with my family, and I told them I was, I was like, I'm going to run away. And so I <laughs> ran out the door, and we used to have, back in those days, we, we still had a milkman. And so we, we had, like, a milk box outside my house. Gosh, where... how old are you, Christy? You had a milkman? Ah, yes, we did. You're, like, 80 That's or something. Secret. <laughs> yeah, and so there was, like, a little milk box outside my house. And, um, and I ran outside, and that's about as far as I got because I was yeah. pretty scared. I was like, I, I, yeah, I didn't get much farther than my front door. <laughs> Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. So uh, let's get into the, the whole bird language thing. And I think what might be good is to, as we're starting off, just to kind of, just kind of define what it is. Because I think mm -hmm. when you say bird language, some people are thinking uh, you want to know what the birds are doing. Some people are thinking you're actually exchanging words with the birds, like, Let's let's start off by kind of clarifying what what it is when we say bird language, like what what it means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does confuse a lot of people, especially. It depends on what what group of people you're talking to. Like if I'm talking to a bunch of birders and I say bird language, they think I'm talking about bird song. So they think that I'm going to teach them how to learn about bird song, which is something I do. It's actually one of the courses that I have um, advertised right now, where it starts on March 11th, is one of my bird song courses, but that's not the bird language course. So bird song is, learning bird song is really about learning how to understand the calls and the songs of birds. Now bird language includes bird song, but it's very different. So how I would, I guess, define it or describe it is, um, is that it's the language of the forest and it doesn't just have to be with the birds it's you know you can think about if you walk into the woods and um let's just say you're you're not being uh you're, you're not in a very zen state and you just kind of walk and bum, bumble into the woods 
and a lot of people are familiar with this particular sound. They hear a squirrel yelling at them. You're like, pew, 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 pew. You know, it's just like that loud squirrel call. And so the squirrel is communicating danger. It's communicating that there's a source of danger there. And so um, the beauty of bird language is that the birds are all around us. So there's, you know, uh, not everyone has squirrels around them, um, but there's no matter where you go, just about on every continent and even Antarctica, there's birds. And um, and so we can list if if we learn to listen and understand what they're saying then we can know if there's danger in the forest. So they literally will tell you if there is a cougar in the forest. And they have particular calls that they'll make, and we call them shapes of alarm. So there's a particular shape that the birds um, get into for different, um, different predators. So you can learn to distinguish those shapes of alarm and be able to know if it's a fox or a coyote or a skunk or a cougar, you know? So just like a, just like a human would have different reactions to like, you know, say a person walks next to you that you don't like, or uh, or uh, a car almost runs into you, or like a, a wolf is is running by. Like you have like a human has different reactions, and so do the birds. Yeah, and I would say it's good to keep in mind that in the natural world. I'm just watching right now. I'm keeping my eye on outside always just to see if birds are flying by. And there's actually someone releasing a bunch of balloons. I was like, well, it's really colorful birds going out there. <laughs> but there's a bunch of balloons going by. Um, yeah, so it's really important to keep in mind that um, that any creature in the natural world, any wild creature, um, literally is, is, is surviving. Um, I don't always like to focus on the idea of survival, but... Um, you know, let's just think about like a little songbird, for instance. So that songbird is, and if you've ever watched like a robin feeding on the ground, like what do they often do? Like they'll, they'll walk around a little bit and then they'll peck on the ground and they'll look up and they'll peck and they'll look up and they'll peck and they'll look up. So they're always, always, always on guard um, because they have to be, because they could be taken out at any moment by an aerial predator, by a ground predator, by one of us, like, the birds are just, the birds in, in all wildlife, like there's always something out to get them. Um, and I think it's important for us to like, the only, the closest, uh, I guess, relation that we might have to that is um, in sort of the human world is if there was like some kind of bad guy or bad girl, you know, in the neighborhood, if there was like actually a sniper, you know, uh, like add like a sniper in your neighborhood along with like a, a, a robber or someone that's gonna like rob your home. And like, you know, that's what these birds are, are up against like every day and they have to continue going on with their lives. So they have to keep, it's like, I imagine what it must be like to live in Syria, for instance, right now. It's like, yeah. you, you have to keep going on with your life. You can't stop like going to the market for food or going outside to gather your water. You know, you have to keep moving and so, the birds are adept at picking this up, and there are certain birds that are more that are more focused on um, the language of the forest, and will are, are good to focus on. But um, yeah, I hope that is, that explains it a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that explains it. So we're talking about you know the uh, well, I guess at, at this point we're talking about more you know bird bird reactions. You know, so reading what the what the birds are kind of thinking. Um, mm -hmm. You talked about, uh, and this is something that that you and I discussed there, um, like their reactions and, and how different people can benefit from like learning bird language. Because it seems like a like a soft skill that most uh -huh. folks wouldn't necessarily be interested in. But like, what uh -huh. kind of what kind of people do you think mostly are motivated to learn bird language? Um, the 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 folks that I'm aware of that do this um one are just general naturalists like people who just love nature right um yeah. but hunters like anyone who's into hunting like if you can learn bird language like you'll be so keyed into what's happening there in the forest um and so i mean hunters a lot of hunters already are they already know like some of the things that i teach people like some of the skills that i teach folks on how to um, observe the natural world like hunters already know um, they're either trained that, you know, from their parents or grandparents, you know, when they're when they're young. Um, and yeah, so I see hunters. And then um, I think you and I talked about this once. There was a friend of ours who was on a survival show um, not too long ago. And this was more of like a game slash survival show. And there was like different teams and they had to like sort of 
chase each other and fight each other. And I was watching one of the episodes because one of you know our friends was in there, and uh, and I saw this like these two these two people on this one team were hiding, and the other team was like looking around trying to find them, and, like we can't find them. And like the whole time there's a J alarming at the people hiding. And I'm like, ah, oh, if they only knew bird language, they would know right where the people were hiding, you know? And so I, I think honestly, it's for like anyone. I think it's anyone that wants to be more aware of what's happening in the world around us. Yeah. What, what show? I don't remember that at all. I remember you, maybe, met, maybe I remember I you, to... you mentioned that, but I, I had no idea what what um, show it, was. it was a show. I don't think it had a, a, a long longevity, like a longevity on, on TV. But it was <laughs> one that uh, it was one right after the Hunger Games came out. They created this like dramatic kind of survival. It wasn't even survival nest. It kind of was survival. It was sort of a survival game show um, where they took people to, like to this place in British Columbia and they stuck them on the island. It was a whole group of people and you ran teams and you had to go and like basically like find one team. The other one would hide and it was this whole like yeah. Hide and seek. Kind of like a hide and seek. It sounds like really games. fun. <laughs> yeah, I think they had a good time, and it was definitely like a Hunger Games, like Big Brother kind of thing, where like you know all of a sudden Big Brother would come in and tell you you had to do something or go somewhere, and yeah, or you had like you know it was like also I think what happened to one of the groups was they were in it a couple weeks already, and you know you start to get tired and lonely, missing your family, and it's like all of a sudden you have a call from your grandma, you know, and it's just like ooh, what does that do to you, you know, and. That sounds so bizarre. I have no idea. Yeah, it was kind of, yeah. if you're was, if you're like listening to this and you know what the show was, you should you should comment because I have no idea. I, I don't remember it. the name. Maybe either. you know it probably came out while I was like in British Columbia or something. It I, might have. Cause it, yeah. It was like I would have to say it's probably like maybe when, when did Hunger Games come out? Like three or four years ago. Well, they had, there's three of them, right? So yeah, like the first one. Yeah, so it was a long time ago. Okay, well, it was while I was still in college, so it had to be within the last seven years. I'm pretty, it was like last five years that it happened, so. Interesting. Five years. Yeah, yeah I mean, that, that's still like Hunger Games territory. No, yeah, that would have been like between the second and third. It's neither here nor there, but it's kind of funny, kind of interesting to like think about. Yeah, my my experience of that was, uh, you know, we at Rabbitsick, we were doing um, the uh, Rabbitsick, by the way, is primitive skills gathering we talk about it uh you know a lot on previous episodes but uh, a bunch of people get together in the woods to learn skills and i remember i was doing our, our sit spot in the morning you know for like 6 a.m and sit in the cold and listen to Go birds watch the bird. yeah and watch the birds <laughs> and uh i remember hearing you know one alarm behind me and thinking like come on th- th- am i being this obvious that i what did i set the thing off and then it was actually someone walking, you know, behind that I couldn't hear yet. Like, I couldn't hear their footsteps. Yeah. But the, there was a bird alarm. So, like, yeah. knowing that. So, you know, as a hunter or, like, awareness to predators in the area. Like, Nicole Pellion talks about, like, leopards approaching in mm-hmm. Africa. Like, you hear the baboons mm-hmm. or whatever. <laughs> the, yeah. the monkeys or whatever they had. The, that's the yep. leopards or getting closer yeah closer. i have a great story there's a friend of mine um who runs a, a, a women's wilderness organization in boulder colorado and she had done one of my courses and then she went like after like it was like a couple weeks later she was going on a hike with her um with her husband at the time and um they were just, it was literally like right outside of boulder i guess in boulder colorado there's like these nice trails like right outside of town and so she was at the trailhead and she heard these bird alarms it was like I think it was a jay, magpie, and some robins. And she told her husband, she's like, Brian, Brian, like, hang on. Like, listen, do you hear that? And he's like, yeah. And she's like, no, 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 let's, let's wait for a minute. And he's like, all right. And so he's like waiting, and they're both waiting, and they look up the trail. And then all of a sudden, a cougar walks across the trail up ahead. And then it disappeared into the forest, and they couldn't see it anymore. But they just watched where the birds were going. And the birds were basically mobbing this cougar. And so they watched where the birds were going. And as the birds moved up the hill, and then they stopped for a while, they knew exactly where the cougar was. And they didn't have to wonder, like, where is this cougar now? They just watched where the birds were going. And, uh, yeah, and they chose not to hike that trail that day. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. That might have been a good idea. Good idea not to hike that day. Uh, yeah. specifically, yeah, been a lot of, a lot of help in Vancouver Island, knowing where the cougars are. Um, yeah. 
Awesome. So yeah, it's the, it's funny because you think of bird language as being like the the hippy dippy thing to study, and then yeah. it's like who's most interested in this? Uh, hunters. <laughs> no, it really is. It, it is. Yeah. Exactly. It. Yeah. And I think that they already do. I'm just gonna send a quick message to someone right now. Um, someone that just came home. <laughs> Got it. Awesome. Yeah, no, I think it's a good point, Sam, like that, um, you know, and I, one of my neighbors once was a hunter and, um, I was just so impressed with him. We were actually, um, he knew that we were into tracking animals. And so he took us out, uh, he came home one day and he said, Hey, you guys, you want to go see two bobcats? I just, you know, was on the snowmobiles and I, I passed them and I think I can take you to them. And we were like, sure, let's go check them out. And, um, and so we were driving, riding on the back of the snowmobile with him and or snow machine, as some people call it, depending on what part of the country you're in. Um, right. We're on the back of the snow machine with him. And like we were just so impressed. We were going like, I don't know how fast those things go, but we were going fast, maybe like 50 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour, whatever it was. And flying through the forest on this road. And he's like, oh, there's a rabbit over there. You know, oh, there's some elk over there. There's deer over there. And like he was he was like driving this thing, you know, we're on the back like looking around he's he and he just could see it like instantly you know he's so aware um yeah so i think i think the awareness that um hunters naturally have or are trained when they're young is something that like i'm constantly trying to get people to to become more adept at right yeah awesome now how, how did you like get your start in i guess wilderness education as a whole like where, where did that begin and how'd you get to how'd you get to bird stuff from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I suppose it started when I was working at the Wolf Center. Um, I was, uh, yeah, so back in those days, I had a big love for the wilderness and um, I didn't choose to study biology when I was in college. That, Like I said, that was really the only option. Mm -hmm. um, but I really wanted to work and to be in the natural world. And so when I graduated, I learned that um, there was an organization in Idaho um, where they had a pack of wolves. And so I actually got a job with them. It took about a year to get, but I got a job with them. And um, I remember we used to, so we lived in wall tents um, there at the center. And we used to have to park our cars about three quarters of a mile away so that we wouldn't disturb the wolves. Cause we were where we, where we camped, where we were living, like the, the folks who lived there was right next to the enclosure. Like we wouldn't let the visitors ever get that close, but the, um, the staff could be up that close. So we didn't want to bring the cars and just like cause disturbance to them. Yeah. Um, and being a girl from Connecticut, you know, I didn't know much about, uh, cougars and anything like that, but I knew they were out there. And I was scared. Like, I was really scared that I was going to get, like, eaten by a cougar on my walk up from the car to the tent. And I remember um, the guy I was working with at the time, we were walking around the enclosure one day. And it's, this was, like, a, a life-changing moment for me where, um, you know, he just – he knew how scared I was. And, and he just stopped me one day. And, and he was like, well, Christy, you know the birds will tell you if there's a cougar around, right? And I was just like – my whole world just stopped. And I, I, two things happened for me. The first thing was, um, I was like, well, of course, like it was just like one of those dumb moments. I was like, well, of course the birds are going to know, like their life depends on it. So it made total sense to me. And then the other thing that happened was, um, that I just thought to myself, why am I, whatever, I was like 24 or something. I'm like, why am I 24 years old and just learning this now? Right. You know, like, <laughs> I should have known this ever since I was a kiddo. And, and I really, and then that moment I was like, everybody needs to know about this, you know? So I just got super committed to, to wanting to teach people more about it. And, um, and then, uh, both of us actually went on to work for the wilderness awareness school, which is where we met John Young. And John was the one actually that was teaching my friend Keith, um, about bird language. And so we, I got to learn bird language from John, um, directly because we were working with him at the school at that time because at that time he 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 started the wilderness awareness school and um, at that time was you know working directly with the school and the staff so um, yeah so I was really lucky and I got to uh, got to work with them there yeah you guys did all sorts of stuff there though right like you were doing fire stuff and plant stuff and yeah, the, yeah, WAS WAS is like the the short. Yeah, that, name. that's what the that's what the people call it. The people who yeah, WAS, who go there, yeah, and exactly. then you don't know what it is, and you're like, that's really weird. 
what they're saying because wasp sounds like strange but uh right 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 yeah so wilderness awareness school so they yeah so they teach all sorts of things they have uh, like a year-long adult um program they do survival skills they do um what we were just calling soft skills like awareness skills and um and like real like learning how to be in a village with with others um so a lot of community kind of development things and um, or programs that they focus on and uh, they work with kids and adults and um, but yeah we were doing we were we focused at that time I was really focusing on animal tracking and bird language were like the two big programs and wolf tracking we did some wolf tracking expeditions in Idaho so lots of tracking and lots of birds yeah Idaho has got like more and more wolves all the time it seems like right like that's a big wolf yeah. area Yep, yep. There was a re like right about when I started working for the Wolf Center. This was back in '98. I started working there, um, back in the old days. That's 20 years ago. Yeah, that's a long no. time. <laughs> yeah, so 20 years ago, um, they I think it was it might have been in '96 or '92. I forget the exact date, but somewhere around then there was a big reintroduction that happened. Um, you know, in Idaho. And so the wolves have, the, the population has started to take off. And I actually honestly haven't followed it. I don't, I don't know where the population currently is, but I know, you know, there's been wolves that have come back into Yellowstone and, and sort of all around. And it is a contentious thing. You know, there's, there's folks that don't want them there and, and other folks who really love them and, and want them to be around and want to learn how to sort of coexist with the wolves. So, yeah. Wolves are, wolves are, I, I always like really enjoy being around wolves in nature like there's something special about it because they mm -hmm. if you look at them as predators they're very like, they're not likely to attack you mm -hmm. like i think there have been something like four or five people killed by wolves that are like recorded and that's in history of you know north america so it's like it's, yeah. it's like super you know they're not they're not after you <laughs> Right. And so we, it's an interesting thing, um, actually, because, you know, we used to always tell people the phrase we used to say at the Wolf Center was there's never been a documented case of a healthy wild wolf ever attacking a human being in North America. And so yeah. the trick is healthy and wild, like um, because a lot of people want to they, they think wolves are sexy and cool. And so they want to have them as a pet. And that's a really bad idea. Um, cause wolves need a lot of room. They're, they're so, so, so intelligent. Um, and they, they're just go, they basically go crazy in a human environment. They need to move. They need the wild. Um, kind of like people, it's, you know, people go, yeah, crazy exactly. In the environment you, too. <laughs> you know, it's like us, we go a little, like, why, why are we on all these meds these days? You know, yeah. it's just like, we probably shouldn't be boxed up, but, um, yeah, I just, I, not too long ago, I finished reading a book called Wolf Totem, which I think you might find interesting. And I, I believe it was based in Mongolia, if not somewhere like in like southern China or something like that. And uh, I, it was a true story. Um, and a lot of what they talk about in that book actually are where the wolves would attack people. And there was like a fear of wolves over there. And so it was just a, it was a very different dynamic than I was taught. Yeah. Um, about wolves, and I don't know if it's just a different breed of wolves, if they're if they're just different over there. And so, um, I'm not sure if you have any experience with. Well, with what wolves. I what I uh, have like found in doing research on wolves, there's basically the the European wolf, so to speak. It's all kind of related to the gray wolves. Like there's the in the, the Eurasian uh, wolves right. like through that, that entire area. They were way, way, way more known to attack people. But uh -huh. something happened. Maybe it was like the, you know, ancient cultures used to hunt them all the time. And they got scared <laughs> of people or something like that. Yeah. But yeah. that when they got over to North America, it just didn't happen as much. Like yep. people just weren't yep. getting attacked by wolves. You know, who knows what it is. But uh, yeah. yeah, so something about North American wolves. But yeah, we're lucky. We're lucky. Absolutely, yeah. And the uh, I've I've experienced so there's Vancouver Island wolves and then Minnesota wolves uh -huh. and then actually down in New Mexico they've got like the Mexican gray wolf which is like a little yep. one. Yeah. Yeah. So they're they've all been just it, you know just incredible to hear them and kind of interact with them, see their tracks. It's it's a ton of fun. It's a super special moment, and I remember, like, you know, being at the Wolf Center, I lived where there was a pack of wolves, and so I daily I would get to hear them howl, 
and I, I have to say that hearing them howl in the wild, it, it's, it's still such a special experience for me. There's something about a wild wolf that's just, it's magnificent, you know, and there's so much to, I mean, even the captive wolves, I learned so much about, um, about interaction and um, how to get along with people and uh, behavior. And there's just so much that we can learn from, from them. And those were domesticated wolves. And um, we, we tried to keep them as sort of um, untame as possible. Um, but still, they, you know, they, they grew up in an enclosure and around people. But I, you know, I can't imagine, like, as much as I learned from them, how much we could learn from the wild wolves. Right. You know? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, they're and they're resourceful little critters. Like I was talking about uh, when I was on Vancouver Island, seeing uh, scat that it appeared to be some from some kind of canine, but it had like bits of shell and things like that in it. They're that they're like seafood eaters in British yeah. Columbia. Like they go down to the they like yeah. forage for periwinkles and stuff. Right. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I love them. I think they're awesome. And then, yeah. but I think in New Mexico was like the first time I heard wolves uh-huh. ever. That, that was the first experience. And it was just, yeah, it was amazing. Just here, you think this, there's this huge animal with gnashing teeth out in the woods. And uh, it's Whereabouts were you? Gonna, I, I was in the northern Gila wilderness. Yeah. Uh-huh. So I had to drive like three hours on dirt roads to like get to where I was. But yeah, was super, yeah. yeah, super remote place. But yeah, the locals there were like, that's it's pretty rare to actually experience wolves, but there are there is a population in oh. in that area. Okay. So even they said it was pretty rare. Yeah, the, the National Park people, they said it was pretty weird. The National Monument people that I spoke to huh? there, they said it they said it was rare, but there was a lot more in the northern part of that wilderness than in yeah. like the central or southern part. So yeah, it was great to be able to experience that but uh it, i don't know it's kind of I, I guess it's not super similar to bird language because you're you hear um but or did you do any research on like why they howl because if you google this is an interesting thing about wolves you google like why does a wolf howl and some uh-huh. things are like nobody knows why the wolves howl and some people are yeah. like wolves howl because they want to find each other wolves have why like You've heard a lot of wolf, like what? What's your take on wolf howling? Um, to me, it is a lot of communication. You know, it's or to me, it's about communication. And um, you know, there were different types of howls, and so you know, it's like, you know, if we go in the forest and then hear a wolf howl, we just think it's a generic howl. But each howl is distinct, and sort of how long they do it for, and how many of them are howling, and which one is howling, and they're each um, they're communicating with each other. And so, you know, with our pack, um, the really sad part about having um, a captive pack is that, like I said before, that they want to get out. They they don't they don't they they go crazy when they're in too small of an area. Luckily, this the, the, the place where, where we were, it was a 20 acre enclosure, which it, it doesn't seem like that much at all. Like wolves need like hundreds of miles typically yeah. to roam and to run. But that was actually the largest enclosure in North America for a pack of wolves. Um, and even in there, so what happens is that, you know, there's the hierarchy. So there's the alpha male, the, the beta, the alpha male and female, the beta, and there's the omegas who are like the lowest ranking. And there was a brother and sister kind of team who were the omegas. Um, and interestingly enough, the the brother, like the, the male of the omega, like he was the biggest wolf of the pack, but he actually was less dominant than this other one, Kamats, who was the leader. And he... I mean, Kamats was such a wonderful leader. That's what I mean about like learning from them, like just watching how he kept that pack together and like negotiated different dynamics between different individuals. And like he would step in at certain times and then leave things alone at other times and um, intervene when he needed to. But basically what happens is that um, they have this they have this need to move and also need to kill. And they don't get that opportunity in captivity. And so what they do is they go after each other. Um, and so they would every day, basically every night, they would go after and try to attack the Omega female. Um, and what would happen is the, her brother actually would, when he knew that she was getting attacked, he would start to howl, 
which caused the rest of the pack to stop and then they would start to howl and so he was like distracting them away from her it was just it was such an intricate and amazing and sad like it was all you know it was beautiful wonderful and sad all at the same time yeah so know? they wouldn't like release an- like animals live into the enclosure no it was it, probably one, something it illegal about that animals. Yeah, and then and also because these guys didn't grow up in the wild, they don't they didn't know how to hunt. So we forget sometimes that deer are super dangerous. Like a kick from a deer could kill a, could kill a wolf, you know. And so in the in the wild, wolves don't have to like live all that long because it's just dangerous to be hunting the way that they're hunting. And yeah, they could break a leg, they could get kicked in the face. And so um, yeah, our wolves didn't have any stand a chance against a deer. You know, I mean, maybe they could have taken it down eventually, but um, they probably would have gotten injured doing so. Yeah. And they were so they're rescues, right? Or they're they're not. They actually so they were um, yeah. they were actually um, wolves that were used for a film, a Discovery Channel movie um, called Wolves at Our Door, um, and they were raised by the filmmaker in the Sawtooth Mountains. And then when the project was done. Um, he had them move to land in Winchester, Idaho, on the Nez Perce Reservation, um, where they were going to sort of live out their lives as ambassadors to their species um, for educational purposes. Yep. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Sweet. The, uh, yeah, man, you talking about wolves. I love those things. They're great. <laughs> They're great. <laughs> so you've actually gotten into, like, teaching bird courses so it's not just it's not strictly a bird language thing it's like how to identify a bird by you know by one feather or by how they're flying or you know all this all this random stuff tell us a little bit more about like the courses that you teach personally yeah so um so what i did it was about maybe four years ago or so so i've been studying birds for 20 years now um and I, about four years ago, um, I, when I, no, actually it was longer. It was se- well, seven years ago when I moved to Durango. So I left Wilderness Awareness School kind of community up there. And I started leading the bird walks here in town. And I would have people come up to me and they'd be like, Christy, how do you know what you know? Like, can I learn from you? And at that time, I was just like, I don't know anything. Like, I just, you know, <laughs> and like, um, anyway. And, and so eventually, like, I sort of just started to take that to heart, you know, that people were, Right. They were learning something from me, and, and I did have something to share. And so I actually um, I developed a curriculum. Well, what I did first was I was looking for something out there. I was like, is there any, any way that I can even learn more, like any courses or whatever? And there just was not – there was one thing that Cornell puts out, but it's like, you know, serious, like almost like Ph.D. level kind of work, and it was really expensive. And, um and it's just not something that just seemed approachable to the general bird lover or even naturalist. And so I was like, you know, I, I think I actually could create something for people. And um, and so I spent about two years creating a master's course um, for people. And I call it Advanced Skills for Beginning Birders. And what it does is it takes people from, like, knowing even just a little bit or even people who are, are a little advanced in their skills, like, to, like beginners to kind of advanced folks, and taking them all the way through to where they can really understand bird language. So, like, the, the course is set up into eight modules, and it does do just what you said, where we focus on, I, I develop these seven questions to bird identification. And so yeah. what those seven questions are, are, like, taking, it's kind of like, I just, went to create the course, I just had to ask myself, like, what do I do when I see a bird? Like, something happens in my mind in a split second, and I realized that it's like I ask myself a series of questions, but it all happens in like a, like really like a nanosecond um, that I go through those questions. And uh, so I take, you know, it's basically from like big picture to small picture. And um, each of those questions I've, I've uh, kind of sectioned out into a module. And so I take people through exercises and activities and where you get outside and, you know, you actually do something um, – outside in nature you have a sit spot where you go to like we were talking about what we do at what i do with groups of people at rabbit stick um or at the skills gatherings that we're at um i have people like in a group you know come and and do a sit in the morning and then we figure out what just happened and interpret the language of the birds um and so in my course what i do is i take people um, through different exercises and activities to help them really really learn and deepen their understanding of the birds and not just in markings because 
um, when when new birders are learning about um, about birds, the the very first thing they focus on are the markings, and that's often like a lot of bird books will um, will simply just focus on like the color of the bird, you know, and they're just like, hey, you know, like what if it's a blue bird, it might be one of these ones, but there's so much more. Like I always describe it as like learning to like it's like getting to know a lover you know, or like a new sweetheart or something. It's just like, you don't want to just know their name. You know, you want to know like where they like to eat dinner and, you know, where they sleep at, well, maybe not, that's a little stocky, but you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> you you want to like, just get to know as much as you can about them. Like, wh- like who's in their family and um, you want to listen to their voice more often because it's just so wonderful and, and get to know like the intricacies of, 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 you know, how they think about the world and um, what they like to eat and, so yeah, so it's it, the whole course is all about like really, really deepening your your understanding and relationship with the birds in your area. Yeah, so it's and it's seven different things. When it's there's this, uh, <laughs> I we'll go back to to rabbits. Like how many uh, like how many gatherings have you taught at so far? Like different gatherings. Um, I was just thinking about that. Someone asked me that the other day. Oh. I think it's been like six now. Wow, so because I know you do rabbit stick winter count and then the whatever the one near you is, near Durango. Yeah, there's a local yeah. Durango one. And then I was at Saskatoon last year. This year I'm going to be at Sharpening Stone. Um, and so, yeah. I've never heard of that one. Let me look that up now. Sharpening Stone? Sharpening Stone. Yeah, yeah. It's in, it sounds like so much fun. Of, it is. It's south of Portland. Oh, okay. And that's gonna be, yeah, I have a whole series of courses that I'm doing this spring. Um, and so I'm kind of doing these back-to-back courses. Um and the very end of it is going to be sharpening stone. I'll be I'll be there for a week. I've always wanted to go to Portland just to see if Fred Armisen is there. Who's that? <laughs> Am I supposed to know who that is? <laughs> pro- I don't know. You probably should, but that's it's neither here nor there. We were so there's this great part about rabbit stick where uh, this guy uh, named Tom cooks all these ducks. Like he brings all these ducks and cooks them. Oh yeah, and, yeah. Uh, one of the great things, this is me telling a story about Christy and I. Uh, we were standing in line because he makes duck soup. Every like he, he lets you roast the ducks and then we do duck soup and there's always leftovers. So if you're like a scavenger, you can <laughs> wait around the fire till the duck soup is done. And then you can wait until like kids who don't eat all their soup and you can eat their <laughs> soup too. You know, you can like scavenge duck. That's one of my favorite parts about rabbit stick is scavenging the duck stuff. But uh, we were in in line with uh, one of my friends, Missoula Josh, and uh, I'm the only one who calls him that, uh, Missoula Josh. No, I think it's but, catching uh, on now. It's actually uh, catching really? on. Really? Yeah. Because yeah, I wasn't there this year. We're referencing him that way this year. Yeah. How many How many people have called him Missoula Josh? I don't know, but, but people were saying that they'd be like, oh, Josh, which one? Missoula Josh? It's like, oh, yeah, Missoula Josh. <laughs> yeah. So oh, started a trend. If that catches on, well, oh, super <laughs> funny. But anyway, Josh is a really sharp cat who lives in Missoula, as he uh, might know, and uh, so super outdoorsy, buckskin-wearing guy. And uh, we, the three of us are standing in the line together, and we see a hawk fly by. And Josh is like, oh, I think that's, isn't that like a Cooper's or something like that? And Christy has to speak up. And she's like, well, that's actually a really good ID. It's not a Cooper's hawk, but here's what it is. And here's why it's different than that one. So like <laughs> learning how to how to tell, you know, what a certain bird is by how they fly and that. Do you remember that instance? No, I don't actually. So it was a, it was a gosh hawk. Is that how you say it? Yeah. The goshawk, it was that instead of a Cooper's hawk, and for some uh-huh. reason you uh-huh. identified, you know, the the body shape or the pattern uh-huh. of the the bird in flight, and it was like this is ridiculous because it was like in front of the sun, so like all you could see is the profile and not the colors, <laughs> and just ridiculous. Um, and so that's that's when I actually started believing all the all the stuff Christy was saying when she actually ID a bird. <laughs> Flying into like, oh, directly. Maybe she in, does know something. Yeah, flying directly <laughs> into the into the sunlight. But uh, so that was pretty that was pretty fun for me. But so what you do is you, you bring people around and go to the gatherings and you teach like 
uh, you know, a, a preview to your curriculum. So if you yeah. go to one of the gatherings, which we always encourage, you can get in and like do Christie's thing, and then you know Christie in the morning, and then go learn something else in the afternoon or whatever you want. So it's really fun. It's a really good opportunity to, to get in and and you know learn a bunch of stuff for real cheap. If yeah. You want to? Yeah. Yeah, I agree, and I, that's one reason why I love doing the bird sits. We do them before breakfast, and so, you know, you're not missing any other programs or whatever other courses are happening, and and honestly, it's like, it seems like, oh, you're just sitting out there in nature in the morning, but, like, there's so much learning that happens. It's like a whole other course, you know, just from watching and observing in the morning, and actually, oh, you weren't there this year, so we had two guys um, Rex from Texas and uh, Rocco from New York, go figure. Um, <laughs> two like quintessential men from each place. Yeah. So these two guys were had come to like every bird sit that I did that that year this year. And um, the last morning they were out there and they each had a wren come and land on them. Well, that's cool. It was pretty awesome. Yeah, land they were both like up. so. They were like glowing like little seven year old boys when they came back. So like, guess <laughs> what happened? <laughs> Vixen, Rocco. Rocco. Rocco <laughs> it sounds like Rocco. a really bad comedy. Rex and Rocco to Idaho. Uh, <laughs> that's great. Have you guys had have you guys had a moose like go through the sits yet? No, we haven't had one go through the sits. We we were um when I walk through, like, because I usually come through before everybody else in the morning, and there was one that, like, was pretty close to where I was walking um, in the morning. They're really close to us there, and um, it just, you know, as the week progresses, they, they move a little bit further out, but um, I know that first year that you were doing it with me, we're sitting in a slightly different spot now. Um, it's a little bit uh, more private, um, but where we were before, like, you could just hear the moose, like, chomping away at yeah. whatever they were eating. You know, it's like they're right there. You can touch them in some places, so, yeah. They're in, like, muskrats, too. Yeah, And so yeah. It's, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. So that's something I would encourage folks to do. And you can go to, like, one. You can go, like, today we're talking about bird language. And sometimes Christy does, like, goofy stuff with you, like, uh, like makes you do bird skits, <laughs> which... I don't know why, but it's something about a group setting where, like, you say, we're going to do this, and everyone in the group just does it. Just, yeah. It's this human thing. Like, you I wouldn't know. normally do it, but you do it. So one of the – one of the, the uh, oh, you better describe it, Christy, because I'm going to butcher it if about I do. About what, what we do? About the skits. Bird skits. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. Like every time I do it, I'm like, I can't believe these people are actually doing this, you know. But <laughs> it's um for me. Well, I don't want to give too much yeah. of it away because I think it's um it's yeah. I don't want to I don't want to give them the secret because there's kind of like a secret to it. Um, or not to doing the skit, but there's like something that happens. So if anyone listening is actually going to come and participate, I think it's uh it's a worthwhile experience because what you end up walking away with is like a visceral experience of what these birds um, do every day and what they what they have to experience. And um, it really, to me, that deepens your understanding of the birds and then gives you a sense of, of the bird language, you know, like why a bird would maybe respond in a particular way. And, and so that I was in earlier um, on the podcast, we were talking about um, the shapes of alarm. And so this particular exercise really gives you a good sense of, um, or helps you to understand what a particular bird would, how it would respond to a particular predator. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so basically the, the little bit I can tell you is that I have people, um, people, uh, they get to be different birds and then we have, uh, someone gets to be a predator and, uh, you can just imagine what starts to happen with, with that. But, you know, if, if people, the more, I guess, um, involved and engrossed people get into the exercise, um, the more profound the experience is for people. Some people have like really profound experiences, um, with, with, with that exercise. Right. Awesome. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Because we are. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun, even though you, <laughs> you kind of wonder halfway through, like, why am I doing this? But it's good fun, and you, you do get something out of it, for sure. Um, yeah. But it's the, what are you talking about, like, the seven ways of identifying birds? Is yeah, that, it's the seven it? questions to bird identification. What, what are the seven questions? Because people will probably be like, oh, yeah, I know that. 
Like that's uh-huh. what I do with them, put it together. So what are, what's like yeah. Christy's seven questions? Yeah. So, um, there's a great acronym that one of my first students, she's the owner of a bookstore here in town that she came up with and it's just perfect. And the acronym is how birds show silly people something more. So the how is habitat. The, um, birds is, so I'll just go, I'll say it. So habitat behavior, how birds show is shape size, then posture, and then um, song and marking. So markings is actually the very last thing that I consider um, when I'm looking at a bird, even though most people, like when they're first learning, they they think it's the very first thing that they should look at. And um, and actually there's so much more that goes into our, our awareness um, before before we ever even see the markings that, um, you, you know, like, like you were saying, like you could just look at the silhouette of a bird and because you can see the shape of its wings and its flight pattern and know the habitat that you're in, you already know so much about what the possible options are for that bird. So yeah, you don't even ever have to see any car- colors or markings on it. Right. Awesome. Yeah. It's super, yeah. super cool. And then you were yeah. also talking about like, you know, taking a single feather and being able to to look at it in a way and you know be able to determine what bird it is and, and saying how a lot of people kind of see it as like whatever bird they want it to be in uh-huh. the feather like you might find a turkey feather and think it's a hawk feather because that sounds yeah. cooler to you yeah but. yeah that happens all the time people people will be like christy check out this feather in my hat they'll be like christy check out the hawk feather in my hat and i'm like should i tell them yeah. <laughs> <laughs> turkey feather should I just let this one be or should I, you know? <laughs> I think yeah. you should say it's a turkey feather, but that's okay because turkeys are significantly cooler than hawks. Or just as cool. Or just as cool. Sorry, I don't want to discriminate against birds. <laughs> just as cool as hawks. Yeah, they're uh, just as cool. Basically, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah, and Christy, actually, we should probably, we got to mention like, how to find you other places because Christy has this great YouTube channel. It's, it's one of the YouTube channels that uh, you watch the videos and you're, you're like, hey, that was really good. I actually learned a lot of, of stuff from that. Uh, oh, and then you look and, there, and there's like 27 views on the videos. <laughs> <laughs> it's been up for like three years and there's 27 views and you're like, oh, uh-huh. that's kind of a bummer. So let's uh-huh. make that not the case. <laughs> and uh, actually, I'll look it up right now. Let's see how many how Christy's doing on YouTube. But uh, go over to, and what's what's it under, Christy? What's your YouTube channel? Um, most likely all my stuff is under Bird Mentor. So Bird Mentor is my website, birdmentor.com. And the YouTube channel should also be under Bird Mentor. So you can find me just even on Facebook and Instagram. Everything's under Bird Mentor. Bird Mentor, awesome. Okay, yeah. more than 23 views per video. Um, and, of course, it's all good. So identifying bird feathers, uh, bird migration, different things like that. So learning about birds and really good little little tidbits about it um but then bird mentor is like this new kind of business you've started around your your curriculum right so tell us about bird mentor yeah so bird mentor it's actually been going it's actually been live for about four years now um and i have uh all of my courses so i have my master's course which is called advanced skills for beginning birders uh, that's on there. I also do a bird song course, which I only offer once a year, and we're actually offering it right now. Um, it's going to start on March 11th. Um, and there's, if, if I'm not sure when you're going to air this, but that means I have to actually get this out. Yeah, you better do soon. it soon because because if uh, if you get it out this week for any reason, then people will be able to get a deal on the uh, the cost of the course. Um, so there's the bird song course, and then uh, also. I'm not sure if I'll do this one every year, but I did I did a bird feather identification course um, this last year, so that's on there. And then um, under events, there's like an events tab. Um, I have my current events that I'm doing, and so those are like courses that I do around the country. And um, some of those include the skills gatherings, and then other ones like um, this spring I have a whole bunch. Like if anyone's near the uh, southwestern corner of Colorado, I'll be doing a weekend um, workshop here in Mancus, Colorado. And then um, after that, I go to the Green River and I partnered with um, an organization called the River's Path. And we're doing a week long um, bird and canoe adventure. Um, and then that sounds about, awesome. 
<laughs> it's going to be, yeah, that's, I mean, we already have folks. I, I don't, that one, I would say if you're interested, sign up soon because we have limited spaces on that one. Some of the other ones we can take more people. Um, the other one that also is pretty awesome that I'm really excited about is a course we're calling Vintage Birding. Um, and that's taking place in Boulder, Utah. And I'm doing that with a couple Boulder Outdoor Survival School instructors. Um, so some of the boss crew and myself. And then we're bringing in an artist as well. And so there's four instructors. And it's just going to be this incredible week of like going back in time and just back to a time when we had time yeah. and um, really like what people used to do a hundred years ago when they were out in nature and we're going to be camping in like wall tents and cooking over the open fire and cast iron pots and making our own bedrolls and um, it's going to be just an amazing and then with the artist people are going to get to spend time like learning how to draw birds and and we're really just going to create it like as a time to like just sit back and learn be able to learn a lot like you'll learn like everything that I have to teach but also doing it in a way where we're, we're really honoring the, the, like what, what people used to do, you know, where there is more of a value for observing nature and for taking time and even taking time and sitting around the campfire and talking, you know, those kind of things that we just don't do as often anymore, you know? Absolutely. That's great. Who are, yeah. the, who are the boss people who are up for it at the moment? Yeah. So Matt Furtis, you know, Matt? I do not. No, and Justin, it's not like I know all of them. I'm like, whoa, yeah, okay. hey, that yeah. I know. Yeah, uh, so, I only know. I only know Randy Champagne. It's the only one. Oh, <laughs> well, it's not Randy. It's Jeff. Jeff <clears throat> and Matt. Jeff owns. Um, Jeff actually used to be the guy that was that ran Boss for a number of years, and now he has his own organization. Um, Matt is a current Boss instructor. Um, Jeff is sort of old school boss and um, super, super just talented man in, in the woods. And he's taking all the stuff that they do at boss and really like slowing it down. You know, it's and he's taking it a, a little bit away from um, just survival skills to um, real appreciation for the natural world and for just learning how to thrive in the natural world. You know, not just about surviving. I mean, he knows all how to do all that, but. Um, his focus is is more on you know how to to be in nature, right. and um, and just have a good time out there you know. Awesome. That's that yeah. sounds like a great course. Um, is there yeah. a way like do you have these on your website or your Facebook page or something like that? Yep. Yeah. So on birdmentor.com you can find all the courses. So the the, the three courses I mentioned earlier were under courses, uh -huh. and then the other ones I just talked about are under a tab called events. So you can find all those under there. Awesome. Birdmentor.com yeah. and the Facebook page is Bird Mentor as well. Yep. I see them on the website right now. You've got Sandhill Cranes there, right? Yeah. This, so I used to be a photographer in one of my past lives. And I'm so good at ID. Are, I'm good, I'm good, uh, at yeah, good ID. job. Good job, Sam. You've learned a few things. I'm just kidding. You knew a lot. I always knew what a Sandhill Crane looks like. <laughs> have, you, have you been to Nebraska for Sandhill Crane migration? No, you're right. You are like, you should be the master of Well, that. I have <laughs> been there for that. It's a lot of fun. No, I actually, actually go, I, really go cool. I actually led some, I led some courses in the Bosque del Apache this, this year. We, uh, there's, uh, another festival called the Festival of Cranes in the Bosque del Apache in New Mexico. So I think you guys actually end up with more cranes than, than we do down here. Well, they funnel, they've got like hundreds of thousands, well, or millions. I think they, they've they seen like over 100,000 a day in some types. And they, they like, well, I might be wrong, but it sounds good for the podcast. And uh, it's basically there's like a 40 or 50 mile stretch on the Platte River that they all funnel through. So it's around like Kearney, Nebraska. Uh-huh. So uh -huh. all the cranes go right through there. God. So, uh, yeah, they have these like permanent enclosure you like sit in and watch the oh. birds like come into the plat and they're in like they're like they're in the fields during the day and they come into the yeah the did river, you get did you ever right? go there like either early in the morning or late at night like when they're leaving or coming yeah well, we were there i i drove a group of um i guess eco tourists or whatever which is code for like old people um who uh <laughs> were a lot <laughs> of fun and uh we we uh yeah, we went out in the evening and just observed and like waited for them to come in, and uh -huh. uh, it was it was not the best night for it when I was there, but it, it's really cool to just you know hear them and 
see them coming. They came in really late, so for like the photographers in the group, they're it was dark outside. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. By the time they're we saw bummed. them, right. So the morning is a good time to go because then you have like the light coming, you know, instead of right. the light going. It's always as a photographer, it was always stressful shooting something at night because you're like, I'm losing the light. You yeah. Know? It's like every second counts. Yeah, or filming something. Yeah. Trying to film yeah. a television program and it gets dark and all that good stuff. Like, oh, we but, lost it. Yeah, but it's fun anyhow. Um, yeah. So that's great. Let's. Uh, we want to end with establishing all the places we can find Christy. And, uh, whoop, there we go. Um, so it's going to be in the show notes, if I ever put show notes together, which I don't. Um, but I will this time, just for Christy. I'm putting it out this uh-huh. week. Bird Mentor on Facebook. Do you have a Twitter? Yeah, so I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Um, I have my website and YouTube. And uh, I think that's it. There's so, probably somewhere else I am, but that's that's all I that's all I know at the moment. So Bird, Bird Mentor across the board. We'll link mm-hmm. it up in the show notes. And if you're out there and you enjoy the outdoors, you like bushcraft, like survival skills, and you want to be a more well-rounded person, and you actually want to be a like a naturalist, like an outdoor person mm-hmm. who knows what's going on in the natural Deeply world. Connected, Deeply connected. Deeply connected. Well, that's see, my audience is going to hate that. Now no one's going to sign up. Oh, for, uh, darn it. Deeply connected. Let's have – I'll explain it like Christy is going to explain it. If you just want to feel more connected <laughs> – no. If you just want your energy to flow throughout no, that's not the natural oh. world, oh. then go to birdmentor.com or the If you want to be a badass link. naturalist out there, then see that'll really resonate with folks. We're going for the male like twenty-one to sixty. Okay. Ratio here. So if you want to be a badass, badass survivalist, then you really need to learn bird language. You do. It's necessary. Yeah. Bird it's language. necessary. And I also have to mark this. Uh, she said she said ass, so I have to mark this as the uh, explicit or whatever. Now, you go bleak. Which is where it, Jose actually got us onto that now from after we did the Jose podcast. So, uh-huh. now, so now all of our podcasts have cursing in them. It's, it's not family friendly you, anymore. You need to like bleep every every other word out. For yeah, you. yeah. It's it was fun though. It was fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, thank you very much, Christy, and everyone hop, up, hop on over to thebirdmentor.com, see what it's all about. All right, well, there you have it, folks. That's my interview with Christy Dragonis, the Bird Mentor. I want to thank you so much for sticking through, even though we had a little bit of not-so-ideal audio there um, on my end of things, and I hope you are uh, around for another podcast interview coming up real soon.